Chapter 17, Part 1 of Astounding Stories 8, August 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Astounding Stories 8, August 1930 by Arthur J. Burks. Chapter 17, Part 1. The Flying City by H. Thompson Rich. From space came Kor's disk city of Vada, its mighty age-old engines weakening, its horde of dwarves hungry for the earth. In the burning solitude of the great Arizona desert, some two miles south of Ajo, a young scientist was about to perform an experiment that might have far-reaching results for humanity. The scientist was Gordon Kendrick, a tall, tanned, robust chap who looked more like a prospector in search of gold than a professor of physics from the State University of Tucson. Indeed, he was in a way a prospector, since it was gold he sought, some practical method of tapping the vast radio-energetic treasure of the sun, and it was an apparatus designed to accomplish just this that he was about to test. The primary unit of the mechanism comprised a spheroidal vacuum tube, measuring a little over a foot across its long axis, mounted in a steel bracket that held it horizontal with the ground. Down through its short axis ran a shaft on which was centered a light cross of aluminum wire, carrying four veins of mica, one face of each coated with lamp black. A flexible cable led from the bottom of this shaft to the base of the bracket, where it was geared to a small electric motor driven by two dry cells. A rheostat switch for delivering and controlling the current was mounted nearby. At the wide arc of the egg-shaped tube was a concave platinum cathode. At the narrow arc, a nib of some sort, ending in a socket. From this socket, two heavy insulated wires extended sixty feet or so across the sand to the secondary unit of the mechanism, which was roughly a series of resistance coils resembling those in an ordinary electric heater. As Kendrick prepared to test this delicate apparatus that represented so much of his time and thought, held so much of his hope locked up in it, a turmoil was in his heart, though his brown face was calm. If his theories were right, that revolving cross would tap and draw into its veins radio-energetic waves of force, much as the whirling armature of a dynamo draws into its coils electromagnetic waves of force. For the blackened sides of the veins, absorbing more radiation than the bright sides, would cause the molecules to rebound from the warmer surfaces with greater velocity, setting up an alternate pressure and bringing the rays to a focus on the cathode, where they would be reflected to the nib as waves of heatricity, to use the word he had coined. Those were Kendrick's theories, and now he moved to put them to the supreme test. Switching on the current, he set the motor going. In response, the cross began to revolve, slowly at first, then faster faster as he opened the rheostat wider eyes fixed on his resistance coils he gave a sudden cry of triumph yes there was no doubt about it they were growing red glowing brightly whitely above the intense desert sunlight here was a means of convening solar radiation into heat then that offered tremendous commercial possibilities but even as he exulted there came a blinding flash and the overtaxed coils burst into flame Shielding his eyes from the glare, he reached for the rheostat, shut off the current, rushed to his secondary unit, where he beheld an amazing sight. Not only had this part of the apparatus completely disintegrated, but the sand of the desert floor under it as well. On the spot quivered a miniature lake of molten glass. As Kendrick stood ruefully beside that fiery pool, meditating on the spectacular, but not altogether gratifying results of his experiment, a peculiar 
low humming sound reached his ears. Rushing back to his primary unit, with the thought that perhaps by some chance he had not fully closed the rheostat, he looked at the cross. But no, the veins were still. The humming increased, however, grew into a vibration that made his eardrums ache. Puzzled, he looked around. What on earth could it be? Had his unruly experiment called into play some tremendous unsuspected force of the universe? Was he to bring the world to ruin as a result of his blind groping after this new giant of power? Such predictions had often been made by the ignorant, to be dismissed by scientists as the veriest nonsense. But was there some truth in this universal fear after all? Was he to be the Prometheus who stole fire from Olympus? The Samson who toppled down the temple? Chilled, dizzied with pain of the ever-increasing vibration, he gritted his teeth, awaiting he knew not what. Then it came, a spectacle so staggering that he went rigid with awe as he regarded it. All power of motion utterly numbed for the moment. The vibration ceased. The thing appeared. It was a city. A city in the air. A flying city! As Kendrick stood staring at this phenomenon, he could scarcely credit his senses. Had the magic carpet of Baghdad suddenly materialized before him, he would not have been more astounded. And indeed, it was in a way a magic carpet, a great disc-like affair, several miles in diameter, its myriad towers and spires glinting like gold under the noonday sun, while its vast shadow fell athwart the desert like the pall of an eclipse. The lower portion, he noted, was in the main flat, though a number of wardish protuberances jutted down from it, ejecting a pale violet emanation. Whatever this was, it seemed to have the effect of holding the thing motionless in the air, for it hovered there quite easily, a hundred yards or so above the ground. But what was it? Where was it from? What had brought it? Those were the questions he wanted answered, and they were to be sooner than he knew. As he stood there speculating, a device like a trap-door opened in the base of the disk, and creatures resembling human beings began descending, began floating down, rather, whereupon Kendrick did what any sensible man would have done under similar circumstances. He reacted into motion. In short, he ran. Glancing back over his shoulder after a minute or two, however, he drew up sheepishly of that strange apparition, and those who had descended from it, there was not a trace, not a shadow. But the peculiar humming had recommenced. He realized in the next breath, and at the same instant he felt himself seized by invisible hands. There was a struggle, but it was brief and futile. When it was over, his captors became visible once more. They were singular little beings about four feet tall, with strange, wise, leathery faces their heads grotesquely bald. The humming had ceased again. The disc, too, was once more visible. What happened next was something even more astounding, if there could be any further degrees of wonder possible for the utterly baffled young scientist. He felt himself lifted up, leaving the desert floor, whirling away toward the incredible phenomenon hovering there. Another moment or two, and he had been borne up through its trap-door opening, was standing in a dark space bounded by solid metal walls. Then he was thrust into a cylinder with several of his tiny guards shot swiftly upward. A door opened as they came to rest, and he was led out into a vast courtyard of gleaming amber crystal. Something like a taxi slid up with iridescent planes, and he was bundled into it, whirled away again. Down broad, gleaming avenues they passed, where similar traffic flowed densely, but under marvelous control. Towering skyscrapers loomed to right and left. Tier on tier of upper and lower boulevards revealed themselves, all crowded with automotive and pedestrian activity. At length, a stupendous concourse was reached. Thousands of these taxis and similar vehicles were parked along its broad flanks while literal swarms of diminutive individuals circulated to and fro. 
assisted from the vehicle that had brought him to this obvious center of the disk's activities, Kendrick was led into a monumental structure of jade green stone that towered a full hundred stories above the street level. There he was escorted into another of those projectile-like elevators, shot up, up, till at length it came to rest. The door opened, and he was led out into a small lobby of the same amber crystal he had observed before. By now his guards had diminished to two, but he no longer made any effort to escape. Wherever this amazing adventure might lead, he was resolved to follow it through. One of the guards had advanced to a jeweled door and was pressing a button. In response, the door opened. A golden-robed, regal creature stood there. Though dwarfed to four feet, like his fellow, he was obviously their mental superior to prodigious degree. Not only was his symmetrical bald head of large brain content, but the finely cut features of his parchment face bore the unmistakable stamp of a powerful intellect. Eocha, commanded this evident monarch of the disk, addressing the guards. They bowed and departed abruptly. My dear Kendrick, the regal personage now said in thin, precise English, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome you to my humble quarters. Pray, enter and make yourself comfortable whereupon he ushered him into a dazzling apartment that was one vast mosaic of precious gems, indicated a richly carved chair into which the young scientist dropped wonderingly. "'Now then, Professor,' continued the mighty little dwarf, when he was seated in a chair even more sumptuous, "'suppose we have a friendly little discussion. I have been much interested in your experiments on heat radiation. What you demonstrated this morning, in particular, was most absorbing. You have hit upon a rather profound scientific principle, yes? Probably, Kendrick admitted, quite conscious that he was being patronized. Oh, don't be modest, my dear fellow, smiled the dwarf. I am the last one to belittle your achievement. Indeed, it is because of it that I have invited you here today. Permit me to introduce myself and to make clear one or two possibly perplexing matters. Then I am sure we shall have a most agreeable chat. His name was Kor, he said, and he was in truth the monarch of this strange realm. His people had come from the one-time planet of Vada. Far distant in the universe, a thousand years ago, this planet had been doomed by the approach of an alien star. Their great scientist, Rav, had met the emergency by inventing the disk, into whose construction they had poured all their resources. The pick of their populace had been salvaged on this giant life raft. The rest had perished when the destroying star had crashed down on the doomed Vada. Since then these survivors and their descendants had been voyaging through space on their marvelous disk. For hundreds of years they had given no thought to the future, content to drift on and on in the interstellar void, breathing an atmosphere produced artificially. But at length the inevitable had happened. This superb piece of mechanism, devised by their super-genius Rav, was beginning to show signs of wear. Some of its mighty engines were nearing the exhaustion point. Either they must soon find a planet comparable with the one they had once known, where they could pause and rehabilitate their machinery, or they must disintegrate and pass into oblivion. Faced with that crisis, Kor had long been seeking such a planet. He had found it, at last, in the Earth and had resolved that this was where they were going to alight and transplant the civilization of ancient Vada, pending such time as they could take to space again. For some months now they had been hovering over various portions of the earth, studying its geography and its peoples. With the result, they had concluded, the United States offered the most logical point for launching the attack. Once this country was subdued, they were in possession of the richest and most advanced section of the planet. 
the conquest of the rest of it could await their leisure. With such an invasion in view, their scientists had mastered the language of the country. This had been accomplished very easily, since in addition to their power of mingling with the populace in an invisible form, they had the principles of radio developed to a high degree and were able to tune in on any station they wanted. Kendrick sat there stunned as Cor followed his astounding revelation of their origin with his calm plan for the conquest of America, of the world. Why, of all the people on earth, had he alone been singled out for this disclosure? He asked the question now. My dear professor, can't you really guess? replied Cor, with that leathery smile. Hasn't it dawned that you are a little too near our own field with that machine of yours? A trifle more research, a slightly different approach, and you would have become a dangerous enemy. You, you mean... I mean there isn't a great deal of difference between the experiments you have been making and those our great Rav once made. For instance, had you broadcast your heatricity, as you call it, instead of trying to transmit it on wires, well, picture a receiving apparatus in each home of the land, like your commercial radio sets. You would have become a billionaire. Don't you see? Kendrick saw indeed. It was simple. So simple. Fool, why hadn't he thought of it? But your invention will never make you wealthy now, my dear fellow. Cor went on tauntingly. You will be our guest here until we have taken over your interesting country. After that, if there is any need for the broadcasting of heat, we will furnish it ourselves. We have those facilities, among others, fully developed. Would you care to see our plant? Kendrick naturally admitted that he would, so the dwarf led him through a rear door and up a winding flight of stairs. They emerged presently into a great laboratory housed in the glass-roofed pinnacle of the tower. There he beheld a sight that left him breathless. Never before had he seen such an assemblage of scientific apparatus. Its vastness and strangeness were fairly overpowering, even to a man as well versed in physiochemical paraphernalia as he was. Before his eyes could take in a tenth part of the spectacle, Cor had led him to the left wall. There, he said, you will observe a development of your heat generator. Kendrick looked to see a long bank of large vacuum tubes, each about three feet high and a foot wide, connected by a central shaft that caused series of little veins in each of them to revolve at lightning speed. Around the apparatus moved numerous small attendants, oiling, wiping, adjusting its many delicate parts. Well, what do you think now? asked Cor. Kendrick made no reply, though he was thinking plenty. You see, it is your invention, my dear professor, the dwarf went on in his taunting voice, only antecedent by a thousand years, and rather more perfected, you must admit. He walked now to the center of the laboratory where stood a huge dial of white crystal, ranked with many levers and switches, all capped with the same material. Behold, he said, throwing over one. Instantly there came again that peculiar low humming that had puzzled him for a few minutes before, and the entire room, its engines, its attendants. Cor himself leapt into invisibility. Only Kendrick remained, facing the faintly visible crystal dial. Then he saw a switch move, as though automatically, but no, for the dwarf's hand was on it now. Visibility had returned and the vibration ceased. That is our central control, said Cor. Our city and all its inhabitants become invisible when that switch is thrown. Only the dial remains for the guidance of the operator, and even that cannot be seen at a distance of more than fifty feet. But now, behold, he raised his hand, 
touched the watch-like device strapped to his wrist and was instantly invisible. But the laboratory and every machine and person in it remained in plain view. Nor was there any vibration now. The next moment, having touched that curious little device again, Cor reappeared. That is the local control, he said. Every one of our inhabitants, except those under discipline, has one of these little mechanisms. It enables us to make ourselves invisible at will. A convenience at times, you must admit. Decidedly, Kendrick agreed. And the principle? Quite simple. One of those, in fact, that lies behind your researches. Doubtless you would have hit upon it yourself in time. Your own scientist, Faraday, you may recall, held the opinion that the various forms under which the forces of matter manifest themselves have a common origin. We of the disk, thanks to our great Rav, have found that common origin. It was the origin of matter itself, Kor said, which lay in the ether of interstellar space energy, raw cosmic vibrations, rays. By harnessing and controlling these various rays, his people had been able to accomplish their seeming miracles, miracles that the people of the Earth, too, were beginning to achieve as in electricity, for instance, and its further application, radio. But the people of Vada had long since mastered such simple rays, and now, in possession of vastly more powerful ones, had the elemental forces of the universe at their disposal. The disk was propelled through space by short rays of tremendously high frequency, up above the ultraviolet. The same rays, directed downward instead of outward, enabled them to overcome the pull of gravity when in a planet's influence, as at present, and the escalator rays by which they could proceed to and from the disk were also of high frequency, as were their invisibility rays. But you, Professor, are more interested in low-frequency rays, the long ones down below infrared, continued Kor. You have seen our development of the heat dynamo principles. It utilizes, I might add, not only solar radiation, but that of the stars as well. There being a billion and a half of these in the universe, many of them a thousand times or more as large as your own sun, we naturally have quite an efficient little heating plant here. It provides us with our weapon of warfare, as well as keeping us warm. Permit me to demonstrate. He led the way to a gleaming circle of glass, like an inverted telescope, about a yard in diameter, mounted in the floor. Look, said the dwarf. Kendrick did so, and there, spread below him, lay the floor of the desert. His camp, his apparatus, were just as he had left them. Kor now moved toward the dial. Behold, he said, pulling a lever. Instantly the scene below was an inferno. Stricken by a blast of stupendous heat, the whole area went molten, lay quivering like a lake of lava in the crater of an active volcano. Suppose, my dear professor, smiled the dwarf, strolling back from the dial. Just suppose, for instance, that instead of that lonely camp, of an obscure scientist. Your proud city of New York had been below there. Kendrick shuddered. Well, he knew now the terrible power, the appalling menace of this strange invader. I would prefer not to make such a supposition, he said quietly with a last thoughtful glance at the witch's cauldron below. Then let us think of pleasanter things. You are my guest of honor, sir. America's foremost scientist, though she may never realize it, with a piping chuckle. Tonight there will be a great banquet in your honor. Meanwhile, suppose I show you to your quarters. Nettled, fuming, though outwardly calm, Kendrick permitted himself to be escorted from the laboratory to an ornate apartment on one of the lower floors. There Cor left him, 
with the polite hint that he would find plenty of attendants handy should he require anything. Alone now in the midst of this vast, nightmarish metropolis, he paced back and forth, back and forth, knowing the hideous fate that threatened the world, but powerless to issue one word of warning, much less avert it. Kendrick was still thinking and brooding along these lines when he saw the door of the apartment swiftly open and close again. Someone had entered invisible. Backing away, he waited, tense. Then, suddenly, his visitor materialized. With a gasp, he saw standing before him a beautiful girl. She was a young woman, rather in her early twenties, not one of these pygmies of the disc either, but a tall, slender creature of his own world. Her hair was dark, modishly bobbed, her eyes were a deep, clear brown, her skin a warm olive, and she was dressed as though she had just stepped off Fifth Avenue, which indeed she had, not so long ago, as he was soon to learn. "'I hope I haven't startled you too much, Mr. Kendrick.' she said in a rich, husky murmur. But, well, there wasn't any other way. Oh, I guess I'll get over it, he replied with a smile. But you have an advantage of me since you know my name. Hers was Majorie Blake, she told him then. Not the daughter of Henderson Blake, he gasped. Yes, with a tremor. His only daughter. Whereupon Kendrick knew the solution of a mystery that had baffled the police for weeks. The newspapers had been full of it at the time. This beautiful girl whose father was one of America's richest men and president of its largest bank had disappeared as though the earth had swallowed her. She had left their summer estate at Great Neck, Long Island, on a bright June morning, bound for New York on a shopping tour, and had simply vanished. Suicide had been hinted by some of the papers but had not been taken seriously since she had no apparent motive for ending her life. Abduction seemed to be the more logical explanation, and huge rewards had been offered by her frantic parents, all to no avail. What had happened was, she now explained, that after visiting several shops and making a number of purchases, she had stepped into Central Park at the plaza for a breath of fresh air before lunching at the Sherry Netherlands, where she had planned to meet some friends. But before advancing a hundred yards along the secluded path, she had been seized by invisible hands, had felt something strapped to her wrist before anyone came in sight, and then, invisible too, had been lifted up, whirled away into a vast humming vibration that sounded through the air. Once on the disk it had swept off into space at incredible speed, pausing only when some hundreds of miles above the earth, and invisible from below without mechanical aid. When its vibration finally ceased, that amazing city had leapt before her eyes. Then her own visibility restored, she had been led into the presence of that mighty little monarch, Kor, who explained that she had been seized as a hostage and would be held as an ace in the hole, pending conquest of her country, since when she had been a prisoner aboard the disk. Learning of Kendrick's capture from gossip among the women, she had taken the first opportunity of coming to him in the hope that between them they might devise some means of escape. Indeed, that was his own fondest hope, their imperative need if the people of America and of the earth were to be saved from this appalling menace. But what basis was there for such a fantastic hope? Just one that he could see. That thing on your wrist, he said, voicing it. I'm surprised he let you wear one of those. They don't, she smiled. I stole it from one of the maids in my apartment. It was the only way I could get here without being seen. I felt I must see you at once. We've got to do something soon, or it'll be too late. I felt that as a scientist, you might have some idea how we could get off. How do people get themselves off? She asked. That escalator ray. Do you know how they use it? No, I've never been able to find out. They don't let me go near that part of the city. Kendrick reflected a moment. Let's have a look at that invisibility affair, he said. She removed it from her wrist, handed it to him, somewhat in awe. He examined it. The mechanism portion, which was linked to a strap of elastic metal, resembled only superficially a watch, he now saw. Rather, 
It had the appearance of some delicate electric switch. Rectangular in shape, it was divided into two halves by a band of white crystal. In each of these halves were two little buttons of the same material, those on one side round, on the other square. Which buttons control the invisibility? he asked. The square ones, she replied. One's pushed in now, you see. If you should push the other, the first would come out, and you'd pass out of the picture, so to speak. Kendrick was half tempted to try the thing then and there, but deferred the impulse. What are the round buttons for? he inquired instead. Marjorie didn't know. She thought they were probably an emergency pair, in case something went wrong with the square ones. In any event, nothing happened when you pushed them. Kendrick pushed one, just to see. It was true, nothing happened. But he seemed to sense a faint, peculiar vibration, and a wave of giddiness swept over him. On pushing the other, which released the first, it stopped. He handed the device back to Marjorie. There's your bracelet. Now, if I can just get one like it, I think we'll get down to earth all right. Oh, Mr. Kendrick. Her eyes lit up eagerly. Then you've thought of a way? N not exactly. I think I've discovered their own way. I can't be certain, but I'm willing to gamble on it if you are. Then you, you think those round buttons are connected with the escalator rays? Exactly. I think they control individual descent and ascent, just as the square ones control individual visibility and invisibility. At any rate, it's the hunch I'm going to act on right now, if you're with me. Oh, I'm with you, she breathed. Anything, death almost, would be preferable to this. Then stand by, invisible. I'm going to get one of my jailers in here and relieve him of his wrist watch. Marjorie touched that little square button on her own. She instantly became invisible. Kendrick touched the button, too, a button he had noticed beside the door. As he had supposed, it brought one of the Vaudens. Shutting the door quietly, he seized the fellow before he could move his hand to his wrist. Thwarted in his attempt to vanish from sight, the diminutive guard attempted an outcry, but Kendrick promptly throttled him. Marjorie had reappeared by now, and together they bound him to a chair, with a gilded cord torn from the drapery. Removing the precious mechanism from his wrist, Kendrick slipped it on his own. Now let's go, he said, pressing the protruding square button of the device. We haven't a minute to— My golly, what a peculiar sensation! It is rather odd, isn't it? She laughed, pressing her own and rejoining him in that invisible realm. Feels like a combination electric massage and cold shower. Where are you, anyway? I, I can't see you. Of course you can't, came an unseen tickle. Here, he felt her brush him. Better hold hands, he suggested, then gave an invisible flush he was glad she couldn't see. All right, a good idea. Her delicate hand came into his, soft warm, heart vibrating even faster than his body, his whole being a quiver with a strange exultation, Kendrick opened the door and they left the apartment. The next half hour was the tensest either of them had ever experienced. Every foot of the way was fraught with peril. Not only did they have to carefully avoid the visible swarms of little people who hurried everywhere, but had to be on their guard as well against any who might be moving about like themselves under cover of invisibility. Nor could they use any elevator or public conveyance, but were obliged to make their way down to the concourse by heaven knew how many flights of stairs, and cross heaven knew how many teeming streets on foot before they reached the amber court, below which the trap-door and their hope of freedom. They got there at last, however, descended and peered down from that yawning brink upon the desert floor, to draw back with gasps of dismay, for the area still gleamed semi-molten from that stupendous blast that had wiped out Kendrick's camp. What is it? she gasped. Swiftly he told her. But isn't there a way around it? Look over there to the left. One edge of the crater seemed to end almost underneath us. It was true that the center of the cauldron was far to the right of where they stood, and that its left rim was only a little within their direct line of descent. But to land even one foot inside that inferno would be as fatal as to light in its very midst. End of Part 1 Recording by Marty 
in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Section 18, Part 2 of Astounding Stories 8, August 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty in Winston, Salem, North Carolina. Astounding Stories 8, August 1930 by Arthur J. Burks. The Flying City, Part 2. Meanwhile, in that great Brooklyn laboratory, Kendrick was working against time, besieged by frantic delegations of the nation's leaders. They knew now that their one hope lay in him. Was he succeeding? Was there even any hope? Face haggard, eyes bloodshot from lack of sleep, he waved them away, went on with his work. I will tell you as soon as I know. That was all he would say. Followed a night that was the blackest in all history though the myriad stars of heaven shone tauntingly brilliant in the summer sky. At length, as dawn was breaking, Kendrick paused in his labors. There, he said grimly, surveying an apparatus that seemed to involve the entire facilities of the laboratory. It is done. Now then, will it work? The delegation were called to witness the test. Henderson Blake was among them, as was Marjorie. She stepped forward as he prepared to make the demonstration. I know somehow you're going to be successful, she murmured, pressing his hand, meeting his eyes with a smile of confidence. I hope you're right, Marjorie, he replied, letting slip the last word almost unconsciously. Her face colored warmly as they stepped back and rejoined her father. Kendrick's heart was beating fast as he turned to his instruments. How could he fail with faith like that behind him? love even perhaps he mustn't fail nor would he if his theories were sound addressing the assemblage he explained briefly the complicated apparatus these towers he said pointing to four steel structures about ten feet high arranged at the corners of a square roughly twenty feet across are miniature radio masts the area enclosed by them we will assume is the city of new york that metal disk suspended above the area represents the invader. It contains a miniature heat generator such as I was experimenting with recently in the Arizona desert. He paused, threw a switch. Somewhere in the laboratory, a dynamo began to whir. I am now sending electromagnetic waves from the four towers, he resumed, but instead of broadcasting them in every direction, I am bending them in concave cathode of force over the city. You may picture this cathode as an invisible shield if you choose, but it is more than that. It is a reflector. If my theories are right, the radio-energetic ray I am about to project upon it from my miniature disk will be flung back to its source as though it had been a ray of light falling on a mirror. The success of the experiment depends upon what the result will be. Kendrick ceased, moved toward a rheostat, as he made ready to touch it. A breathless tension settled upon the assemblage. Upon the outcome of what was now to happen rested the fate of America and the world. Calmly, though every fiber in his being was at breaking stress, the young scientist opened the rheostat. For an instant, the ray seared down. Then, as it boomeranged back, the disk burst into flame, dissolved, disintegrated. A thin dust like carbon slowly settled to the laboratory floor. Cutting off the current from the radio towers, Kendrick faced them, a light of triumph in his tired eyes. You see, it works, he said. They saw, beyond a doubt, it worked. And what Kendrick saw, as his eyes met Marjorie's, made him forget his fatigue. The rest was a mad scramble of preparation. Only a few brief hours remained and much was to be done. The application of the principle that had just been demonstrated involved a hookup from the Consolidated Electric Laboratory with every broadcasting station in the metropolitan area, power being supplied by commandeering every generating plant within a radius of 50 miles. 
The city, moreover, had to be evacuated of all but the few brave hundreds who volunteered to stand by their posts at radio stations and generating plants. As for Kendrick, it was the busiest, most hectic morning he had ever experienced. Only the realization of a girl's love and a nation's trust enabled him to overcome the exhaustion of two sleepless nights. At length, a little before eleven, all was in readiness. Just two questions troubled the young scientist's mind. Had the people of the disk learned of their preparation to counter the attack? And would the improvised broadcasting apparatus of the area stand the stupendous strain that would be placed upon it if the ray came down? The first of these questions was answered staggeringly at a quarter after eleven. Kendrick, oh my God, cried Blake, bursting into the laboratory. Marjorie, they've got her again. Look, read this. He thrust out a piece of paper. Kendrick took it, read, Your daughter will be my queen after this noon. Where'd you get it? He gasped. One of the invisible devils thrust it into my hand right out in the street, not five minutes ago, Blake explained, trembling with anguish. Do you realize what this means, Kendrick? She's on the disc now, and in a scant three quarters of an hour... Yes, I realize, his voice came grimly, and I realize, too, that they don't know their fate. They'll stay. There's forty-five minutes yet. We can't abandon our defense against the ray, not even for Marjorie. But I'll go. I'll rescue her or die with her. And even as Blake mutely reached out his hand to grip that of the determined young man who stood before him, Kendrick touched his wrist mechanism and went invisible. Once on the street, he pressed the escalator button as well, and by the strength of the vibrations that followed, he knew he must be very close within that mysterious lifting zone. Running west the block, he found it growing stronger. Fairly racing now, he continued on toward the river, progress unhampered in the deserted streets. Suddenly, with a thrill of exultation, he felt himself swept up, whirled away toward that great shimmering hulk against the sun. What hope? He was thinking. What possible hope? And the answer came. Core. Reaching the disk, he switched out the escalator influence and hastened across the city to that monumental structure of jade green stone. The mighty little dwarf would be up there in his glittering mosaic apartment, or in his pinnacle laboratory, perhaps ready to pull the lever that would release that stupendous blast of heat. Gaining the jeweled door of the monarch's quarters at last, after escaping detection by a hair's breadth more than once, he pressed the button outside, just as the guard had done that first time. In response, the door opened, and there stood Kor. He stood there an instant, that is, while the expression on his leathery face went from inquiry to alarm. Then, as Kendrick burst into the room and shut the door, he went invisible. In that same instant, the young scientist's eyes beheld a sight that caused his heart to leap. There sat Marjorie, bound in a chair, an expression half of hope, half of dejection on her face. "'It's I, Gordon,' he called. "'Take courage!' "'Oh, I prayed you'd come, and you came,' she murmured as her face lightened. Then tensely she added, "'The door! Look out!' Kendrick wheeled, and just in time, the door was opening. Not so fast, he called, lunging. His hands gripped the dwarf, yanked him back, throttled him before he could admit a cry, pushed the door shut. Cor struggled like a madman, but it was futile. Kendrick's hands cut into his throat like a vice. After a moment or two, he gasped, relaxed. Releasing his grip then, Kendrick felt for his wrist, stripped off his bracelet, whereupon the dwarf became visible. His face was putty white. He was either dead or unconscious. Restoring his own visibility then, he advanced to Marjorie, swiftly freed her. Take this, he said, handing her Cora's bracelet. She slipped it on. Now let's tie him and get out of here. He may be dead, but we can't take any chances. The dwarf wasn't dead, however, for he groaned and opened his eyes as they lifted him into the chair. You win, Professor but it avails you nothing, he smiled maliciously. My capture, my death even, will not prevent the ray. The orders have been given. It will be projected sharp at twelve. 
you but go to your doom. That, said Kendrick, is a matter of opinion. Swiftly they bound him, gagged him. And now, he added, we wish you good day and such fate as you deserve. Then turning to Marjorie, your hand again? There was a new tenderness in its soft warmth that thrilled him. They touched their buttons, went invisible. Silently then, they stole from the apartment. Swiftly they made their way down to the concourse, raced across the city to the amber court, descended to the trap door. It must be nearly twelve, Kendrick knew. He couldn't look at his watch, for it as well as himself was invisible. Indeed, even as they stood there, poised for the plunge, a faint whistle rose from below. Marjorie trembled. Steady, he spoke. Some of them always blow a minute or two before. Are you ready? Yes. Then press your button. Jump! Even as they leapt, the sickening thought came that perhaps the escalator ray was no longer running. But the fear was unwarranted. They were caught up, whirled gently downward. Moving along laterally as they descended, they were able to land without difficulty in the middle of the deserted street near the consolidated electric laboratory. Thank heaven, she sighed, as their feet touched solid ground. They pressed off both buttons, becoming visible once more. Echo, he agreed. So let's... But Kendrick never completed that sentence, for now whistles all over the metropolitan area rising from the generator plants announced the ominous hour. It was high noon. The ultimatum had expired. Lifting tense faces to the disk, they waited. Would that stupendous ray be hurled back upon itself? Or would it sear through their makeshift defense, plunging them and the whole great metropolis into oblivion? Suddenly, catechismically, the answer came. There burst a withering whirlwind from the disk. It struck that mighty concave cathode of interlaced waves above the city. There followed an instant clash of titanic forces. Then the cathode triumphed, hurled it back rocked by a concussion as of two worlds in impact, blinded by a glare that made the sunlight seem feeble in comparison. Marjorie and Kendrick clung together while the disk grew into a satellite of calcium fire in the sky. Presently, as the conflagration waned, they opened their eyes. Gravely, but with deep thanksgiving, they searched each other's faces. In them, they read deep understanding, too, and a new hope. I think we'd better go and find father, she said at length, quietly. I think so, too, he agreed. As they headed toward the laboratory, a fine powdery dust, like volcanic ash, was falling. It continued to fall until the city streets were covered to a depth of an inch or more. Thus passed the menace of Vada. End of The Flying City Part 2 Read by Marty in Winston-Salem, North Carolina Chapter 19 of Astounding Stories 8, August 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 8, August 1930 by Arthur J. Burks. Chapter 19 The Reader's Corner. A MEETING PLACE FOR READERS OF ASTOUNDING STORIES TO THE RESCUE Dear Editor, I hope you can see fit to print this letter in the July issue of Astounding Stories. This letter is written in defense of Ray Cummings, and in reply to the letter of C. Harry Yeager, 2900 Jordan Road, Oakland, California. Following is an extract of Mr. Yeager's letter. Quote, also, I like my authors to make an original contribution to whatever theory of science they develop fictionally. This Ray Cummings does not do in his very interesting story, Phantoms of Reality. His beginning is palpably borrowed from Francis Flagg's story, The Blue Dimension, which appeared in a science fiction magazine in 1927. End quote. Another paragraph is devoted to explaining his claim. He claims that Cummings' method of transporting his characters from one dimension or planet to another is practically copied from Flagg's story, 
the method that is not the narration i hope to prove that if any borrowing was done it was done by flag incidentally flag story the blue dimension was printed in nineteen twenty eight not nineteen twenty seven as mr yeager says i have in my possession a story by ray cummings named into the fourth dimension and published in another magazine during the last month of nineteen twenty six and first ones of nineteen twenty seven and in this story printed two years before flag story cummings uses almost the same apparatus of passing from one dimension to another as is used in phantoms of reality i will not discuss whether this procedure is to be approved or not this letter is not to be construed as an attack on mr yeager or mr flagg or on either of the two stories under discussion if mr yeager will let me know i will send him ray cummings story into the fourth dimension as clipped from the magazines i write this letter to the magazine instead of mr yeager so that if any one was misled by mr yeager's well-meant but mistaken criticism they will be straightened out donald conyon petoskey michigan a wish for success dear editor i have read both of your first issues i am writing to say that i wish you success with your new magazine which i know will succeed also to say i wish you would get more of the carnes and dr bird stories by captain s p meek for i think everybody including myself likes them i also enjoyed creatures of the light thomas d taylor four fifteen south seventh street boise idaho no kick any more dear editor i have been a reader of astounding stories ever since you started it and i guess i'm getting too particular as i don't get the kick out of it any more that i did in the first issues that is i don't get the kick out of all of the stories as i did at first however murder madness sure is a hot one why not print a story by sax romer h g wells or some of them h elworth jones box three forty rural route six battle creek michigan via postcard dear editor astounding stories is an astounding magazine it has really astounding stories it couldn't be better there's hardly room for improvement may astounding stories be more astounding yet i like it monroe hood stinson seventeen forty two twelfth avenue oakland california only fiction dear editor i have just finished a story in the february nineteen thirty issue of astounding stories entitled into space by sterner st paul i would like to know if it is a true story if the actions described in it really happened or is it merely a story of fiction dan s scherer shawneetown illinois perhaps soon dear editor i have just finished reading your new magazine astounding stories it is the best magazine i have ever read keep up the good work and you will find me a constant reader i have only one suggestion to make let astounding stories come out every other thursday Harold Kulko, 433 Palmer East, Detroit, Michigan. More Preferences Dear Editor, I have read with great interest the second issue of Astounding Stories, and note your invitation for readers to express themselves. I enjoyed the whole magazine, finding the literary quality surprisingly high. Especially good were Spawn of the Stars and creatures of the light. Harl Vincent's tale was the best of his I have read, and Captain Meek's are always good. The corpse on the grating, however, was merely Poe's fall of the house of Usher done over, and not half so well. As for the sort of tales I like, here they are in order of preference. 1. Tales of Weird Mystery. Merritt's Moon Pool and his others. Tain's 
white lily two interplanetary adventure a columbus of space by service the skylark of space by smith three different stories that defy classification based on new ideas of science most of wells short stories are examples four detective fourth dimension and air adventure only well done jack williamson box 661 canyon texas a brick or two dear editor for the last three years we have been reading any and all of the various science fiction magazines which have appeared upon the market we therefore feel that we are as well qualified as anyone to offer the criticism and advice that follows first the stories we feel that it would be a good idea to get your stories from the same authors whose work has been and is being accepted by the other magazines in this field in one case you have already done this and i consider his stories to be the best in each issue i believe that you will be forced to do this eventually anyhow because the people who read this magazine will naturally be readers of the others also and will therefore be used to the standard set by those publications then you should have someone who is well qualified to pass upon the science in the stories second the cover design and the pictures at the beginning of each story up to this time the cover and inside pictures have contained many mistakes the cover of the march issue was especially atrocious in the first place a voyager in outer space would find it jet black and studded with stars instead of blue and apparently empty except for a few tremendously oversized planets a moon with entirely too many craters and a total eclipse of the sun with a very much distorted corona visible beside the earth illustrations by your cover artist also appear in another publication but these are much superior to the ones in astounding stories here also a scientific adviser would be welcome third i think it would be a good idea to have a department in which readers could write their opinions of the stories and suggest improvements in the conduct of the magazine fourth i think there should be a scientific editorial in each issue by some eminent scientist this is also a feature in the other magazines we hope that you'll take these criticisms and suggestions as they were offered in good faith we also hope that the circulation will increase as the magazine becomes better George L. Williams and Harry Hylison, 5714 Howe Street, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Wonderful! Dear Editor, I received your magazine last week, Astounding Stories, and I think it is wonderful. I am very glad that I subscribed for it. I can hardly wait to get the latest one, which I hope to receive today, and was very much disappointed when it did not arrive. I hope you will consider a quarterly or at least an annual in the near future. I wish you success with this magazine, and hope you will forgive my writing you so often in reference to your magazine. Louis Wensler, 1935 Woodbine Street, Brooklyn, New York. But we made our bow only last January. Dear Editor, Last month my boy brought one copy of this magazine home, and I want to ask you if you would send me the copies from last January, 1929, up to December, 1929. If you charge no more than three dollars, would you send them COD? Do you have the issues for 1928, too? I never knew there was a magazine like that on the market. I never bought one because most of them are no good, and when one has children, one has to be doubly careful. But this magazine is just right no silly love stories and mushy stuff in them it sure keeps your mind from unpleasant things we can get them from the newsstand but i would like to subscribe for them keep up the good work and please send me the last year's copies and let me know if i could get nineteen twenty eight too mrs m ristan 4684 north broadway denver colorado best one yet dear editor the April issue is the best one you've put out yet. Arthur J. Burks is good. I hope to see much of him in the future. 
Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings is getting better with each installment. The stories of Dr. Bird are always interesting. I would like to see one in each issue if you could arrange for it. As long as the other readers like the size of Astounding Stories, I will too. But please cut all the edges smooth like the latest issue of Five Novels Monthly. I would like to see a full-page illustration with each story, and if possible, by Wesso. I am glad that you are starting another serial in the May issue of Astounding Stories. I like serials, and I hope that you will always have two in each issue. Your schedule for the May issue looks good, and I am sure it will be with such authors as Murray Leinster, Victor Rousseau, Ray Cummings, Harl Vincent, and Sewell P. Wright. I am still waiting for a different colored cover. Jack Darrell, 4225 North Spalding Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. An enthusiastic reader. Dear Editor, As a reader of long standing of science fiction, I feel I am qualified to make some remarks and give my opinion of the wonderful Astounding Stories magazine lately put out. Although I read three other science fiction magazines, None of them have aroused in me such a wonderful enthusiasm as Astounding Stories. Before I forget it, I want to mention that I read two quarterlies also. The reason, or rather reasons, for my enthusiasm I will now enumerate. 1. The stories are wonderful. 2. The binding is very strong and efficient. 3. The print is just right and soothing to the eyes of one who reads much. The paper is good, and the size and price of the magazine is just right. The covers are excellent, and with the addition of the Reader's Corner, the magazine becomes absolutely perfect. Truly a wonderful start. See that it is kept up. The only thing that can still spoil the magazine is poor stories, science fiction stories that contain no science. In Vampires of Venus, the plot was rather weak. Even if the Venerians knew nothing of entomology, they should have brains enough to get rid of the vampires the way Leslie Larner did, without having to call an Earthman to help them. Another thing, the Venerians kept only insects that were not harmful to the crops. On Earth there are such insects who help the farmer by eating harmful insects. If the harmful insects were exterminated, an almost impossible and gigantic task, the harmless insects would change their diet and become harmful too. And it seems funny too that such a highly civilized planet as Venus should still depend on domesticated animals for food, drink, and clothing, instead of manufacturing what they need synthetically. The April cover on your magazine was wonderful. Before I close, I wish to say a word about the Science Correspondence Club, of which I am a proud member. There is little to say, however, after reading Conrad Ruppert's letter in the April issue. The membership has increased to over 300 now, numbering among them quite a number of famous scientists and authors. All I can say is that I hope every scientifically inclined person of whatever nationality, creed, color, or sex they may be will join this wonderful and rapidly progressing club. I will now close thanking the publishers of Astounding Stories for issuing such a wonderful magazine. Stan Osowski, E2, Railroad Street, Central Falls, Rhode Island. But Coniston was an impostor. Dear Editor, I read with interest Mr. Ray Cummings' story, Brigands of the Moon, in the March number of Astounding Stories. The tale was a worthy one from the pen of so clever a writer. I do think, however, that the author might have left out the point about Sir Arthur Coniston, an English gentleman, turning traitor. This sort of thing is hardly calculated to bring about a friendly feeling between England and America, the two greatest countries in the world. I have the greatest admiration for the United States, and though we may have a little fun at each other's expense, there is no ill feeling meant but I really hope you will not publish any other story like that one. An Englishman, Montreal, Canada. Likes the Romance Dear Editor, I have just finished my second copy of Astounding Stories, and I wish to say I have enjoyed every story. 
For some time I have been a reader of science fiction, but none will compare to astounding stories. These stories seem to have the proper amount of romance in them, to make them really interesting, and it adds the proper touch. I have no criticism to make. May I wish you a great success with this magazine. Frank I. Sontag, 825 Prescott Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania. High Praise Dear Editor, Allow me to congratulate you upon the establishment of the Reader's Corner. I do not know which was the first issue of your delightful magazine, but I've been buying it regularly for quite a few months. I may not be an experienced critic, but it can be easily seen by anyone that this magazine is one of the best on sale. I, for one, enjoy your stories more than any other stories I have ever read. I have just finished the second part of the four-part serial entitled Brigands of the Moon. I think Ray Cummings is the best author I have ever met up with in stories. The drawings are fine, the print is excellent, but I think the paper could be improved. But by no means change the size of your little magazine. The size is just right. In your April issue, I read in The Reader's Corner about a science correspondence club. Believe me when I say I'm sending immediately for an application blank. I think the idea of this club is excellent. Truly you have contributed a great gift to the science fiction readers in offering this magazine to the receptive public. Theodore L. Page, 2361 Los Angeles Avenue, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Don't do it! Dear Editor, this afternoon I saw Astounding Stories for the first time, and immediately grabbed a copy, as I have read others of the Clayton Group, and moreover am a science fiction fan. The newsstand has no back numbers, and I simply must have the March 1930 issue, as I wish to read Brigands of the Moon. So here is twenty-five cents in stamps, to cover purchase price, and cost of mailing me a copy of that issue. Have you a complete file since Volume 1, Number 1? If so, what is the cost, including charges? I'm sorry that I missed this magazine before, but you can rest assured that I'll miss no more. In the reader's corner, I notice a call from Stephen Takax for a change in size. Don't do it. The size and shape are okay, and to make it the awkward size of most magazines, including two of the science fiction magazines that I'm now a confirmed reader of, would not improve it a bit. You have two of my favorite authors in the April number. No, I see it is three, Burks, Cummings, and Meek. They are okay, but don't forget a few others, such as Burroughs, Verrill, Hamilton, Koblenz, Keller, Quinn, Williamson, Leinster, Rep, Vincent, Flagg. Oh, why continue? You certainly know all the good authors of our kind of fiction. Try them all. Of course, the other science fiction magazines that I take are full of stories by my favorites, but you can get stories by them, too. From this one issue that I've read, I can see only praise for your publication. Here's to a long life and a happy one. Don't forget to send me the March issue as fast as the mail can get it here. Robert J. Hyatt 1353 Kenyon Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C. Worst Ever Read Dear Editor, Since you invite criticism as well as praise, I am impelled to state that by far the worst story I ever read in any science fiction magazine was Vampires of Venus by Anthony Pelcher, which appeared in your April issue. It was so idiotic, so flat and inane, that it might have passed for a burlesque rather than a straight story, were it not painfully evident that the author was serious. The yarn was unworthy of astounding stories, and did not belong in this magazine. The other stories, except for an amateurish attempt called The Man Who Was Dead, were deeply engrossing and of unusual merit. Sears Langell 1214 Boston Road, New York. The Reader's Corner. All readers are extended a sincere and cordial invitation to come over in the Reader's Corner 
and join in our monthly discussion of stories, authors, scientific principles, and possibilities, everything that's of common interest in connection with our astounding stories. Although from time to time the editor may make a comment or so, this is a department primarily for readers, and we want you to make full use of it. Likes, dislikes, criticisms, explanations, roses, brickbats, suggestions, everything's welcome here. So come over in the reader's corner and discuss it with all of us. The Editor End of Chapter 19 End of Astounding Stories 8 August 1930 by Arthur J. Burks